Welcome to this first basic lecture about one way ANOVA. In this first video, we'll just have a look at the basics of ANOVA. In the next lecture, we'll go into the details about its calculations. ANOVA refers to the analysis of variance, and one way refers to that it involves only one factor. For example, a two-way ANOVA involves two factors. In this lecture, we'll look at an example of blood pressure data. The data includes values that represent the systolic blood pressure from 12 individuals. The study design is balanced in this example, since we have an equal number of observations in each of the three groups. Each age group therefore includes four individuals. The blood pressure has been measured on four young individuals in age 20 to 35, four middle-aged individuals, and four individuals that are older than 55 years of age. ANOVA is a method that can be used when you like to compare the means between three or more groups. The dependent variable should have a continuous scale, and the independent variable, the factor, should have a categorical scale. In our example, the blood pressure has a continuous scale, whereas the age variable has a categorical scale, where the individuals have been grouped into three different age categories. Note that ANOVA can also be used to compare the means of two groups, which will result in an equivalent outcome as the unpaired t-test. Before we go into the details about ANOVA, let's first compare it to the unpaired t-test, so that we understand the difference between the two methods. The f-statistic computed by the ANOVA is in fact equal to the square of the t-statistic from the t-test. In the following example, a two-tailed t-test would result in a t-statistic of negative 2.74 and a p-value of 0 0.034, whereas an ANOVA would result in the same p-value and an f-statistic of 7.5. We see that the f-statistic is equivalent to the squared t-statistic. The two methods use different calculations and are based on different distributions. Note that the t-distribution has two tails whereas the f-distribution has only one tail. When we have only two groups, the f-distribution can be seen as the distribution of the squared values from the t-distribution. For example, if we would draw 100,000 values from a t-distribution with five years of freedom, the values would be distributed like this. Note that about half of the values are negative and half are positive. If we would square all those values, then we would only have positive values that would be distributed like an F distribution with 1 and 5 degrees of freedom. The extra degrees of freedom for an F distribution represents the number of groups that we have, minus 1. In this example, we had only two groups, which means that the first degrees of freedom is equal to 1. Since the t-distribution has both positive and negative values, the t-test can therefore be used to test either a two-sided hypothesis to test if the two means are different, or a one-sided hypothesis to test if one mean is either greater or less than the other mean. In contrast, an ANOVA can only be used to test a two-sided hypothesis since the f-distribution has only one tail with positive values. Therefore, the ANOVA can only test if there is a difference within the means, whereas the t-test can also test if one of the means is greater or less than the other mean. Let's say that we would like to use the t-test to analyze if there is a significant difference in the mean blood pressure between the three different age groups. We compare the mean systolic blood pressure between the young and the middle-aged individuals, and within the young and the old individuals and between the middle-aged and the old individuals. However, every time we do a t-test, an null hypothesis applies, which means that the groups have equal means, we run a 5% risk of committing a type 1 error. A type 1 error is defined as the error we make if we reject the null hypothesis even though it is true. For example, if no difference exists between the population mean values of the two groups, but we mistakenly conclude that there is a difference, then we have committed a type 1 error. The following equation can be used to estimate the risk of making at least one type 1 error. 
where k is the number of independent comparisons we make, and alpha is our significance level, which is usually set to 0 0.05. Note that the equation is only valid for independent comparisons. However, in our example, one group participates in more than one comparison. For example, the mean blood pressure for the old individuals is compared to the mean of the middle-aged group, as well as the mean blood pressure of the young individuals. Therefore, the three comparisons are not independent because the same group is included in two comparisons. However, the equation will still serve as a reasonable estimate for this example. We'll discuss more about independent comparisons in the video about postdoc tests. For our example, we'll make three comparisons, where we set our alpha value to 0 0.05. If we plug in the value 0 0.05 in the equation, and set k to 3, we see that the risk of making at least one type 1 error is about 14%. If we use three independent t-tests where the null hypothesis is true, the risk to commit at least one type 1 error is therefore about 14%. So, the two main advantages of using an ANOVA or a server t-test when we compare three or more groups are First of all, ANOVA compares all means simultaneously and maintains the type 1 error at the designated level. Also, it is a lot easier to run and interpret just one ANOVA compared to several individual t-tests. We'll now have a look at how ANOVA works. The null hypothesis of the test states that the population means of all the groups are equal, whereas the alternative hypothesis states that not all the population means are equal. In our example, the null hypothesis states that the mean systolic blood pressure is the same in the three age categories, whereas the alternative hypothesis states that at least one age group has a mean systolic blood pressure that is different from the other two groups. Note that the alternative hypothesis does not state which of the means that are different. If we reject the null hypothesis, we can perform a so-called postdoc test to identify which mean that is different from the other means. If we do not reject the null hypothesis, we usually do not perform any postdoc test, since the NOVA has told us there is no difference between the means. ANOVA has three major assumptions. The first assumption is that the dependent variable should be normally distributed within each group. This means that the observations within every group should be normally distributed. The ANOVA is, however, quite robust to non-normal distributions. If the assumption on normality is severely violated, one can consider using the corresponding non-parametric kruskal wallis test or try to transform the data. The second assumption states that the variance of each group should be the same which is called homogeneity of variance. This assumption can be tested by, for example, Levine's test. For balanced designs, as in this example, where the sample size are equal across the groups, the ANOVA is quite robust to this assumption. Violating this assumption, especially for unbalanced designs, one can consider using, for example, the Welsh's ANOVA. The final assumption states that the collected observations should be independent. In our example, we have measured the systolic blood pressure of 12 individuals randomly selected from the population. If the data comes from several repeated measurements on the same individuals, one can consider using a repeated measures ANOVA. ANOVA involves the calculations of the so-called F-ratio, also called F-statistic. The F-ratio is the ratio of the variation between the groups and the variation within the groups. The first step in ANOVA calculations is to calculate the mean within the groups. In this example, we will simply calculate the mean of the four observations in each of the three groups. Next, we calculate the so-called grand mean, which is simply the mean of all observations. In this example, we will calculate the mean value based on the 12 observations. Next, we calculate the pool variation within the groups which is based on the distance between the data points and their corresponding group means. Finally, we would estimate the variation between the groups, which is based on the distance between a grand mean and the group means. For example, let's consider the following data. As can be seen, 
the distance between the data points and the corresponding means are greater than the distance between the group means and the grand mean. The variation within the groups is therefore greater than the variation between the groups, since the means of the three groups do not vary much around the grand mean. If the variation within the groups is greater than the variation between the groups, then the F ratio will be less than 1. An F ratio that is less than 1 would be much smaller than the critical value, which is 4.26 in this example, since this is the value that defines 5% of the tail in an F distribution with 2 and 9 degrees of freedom. We'll discuss the degrees of freedom of the ANOVA in the next lecture. The p-value is therefore expected to be much bigger than 0 0.05. We will therefore not reject the null hypothesis in this example. We will therefore conclude that the mean blood pressure is equal between the age groups. In contrast, let's consider the case where the variation between the groups is relatively large compared to the variation within the groups. In this example, we see that the average variation with the group means around the grand mean is larger than the average variation within the groups. The variation within the groups is therefore less than the variation between the groups. In this example, the F ratio will be greater than 4.26, which means that the p-value will be less than 0.05 and that we will reject the null hypothesis. To summarize, we will reject the null hypothesis of the ANOVA only if the variation between the groups is much larger than the variation within the groups. If we reject the null hypothesis of the ANOVA, we know that at least one mean differs from the other means. To see which mean value that differs from the other means, we could perform a so-called postdoc test. For example, for this dataset, rejected the null hypothesis of the ANOVA and performed the postdoc test to analyze the differences between the individual means. A postdoc test is quite similar to performing three separate t-tests based on the following hypotheses. Let's say that the postdoc test results in the following p-values when the individual group means are compared. Based on the p-values, we would reject only the second null hypothesis since the corresponding p-value is the only one that is less than our significance level of 0.05. We would then conclude that there is a significant difference in the mean systolic blood pressure only between young and old people, although it appears to be a difference between, for example, the blood pressure of young and middle-aged individuals. The sample size might be too small to detect it. Before we end this lecture, we'll discuss the importance of using ANOVA instead of separate t-tests. When we use three separate t-tests, the risk that we make at least one type 1 error increases from 5% to about 14%. In comparison, using an ANOVA is like using a filter. We usually only apply the postdoc test if the null hypothesis is rejected by the ANOVA. If the null hypothesis is not rejected by the ANOVA, we do not perform any further tests. This prevents further testing of means that are likely to be equal, which will reduce the risk of committing type 1 error. If all means are equal, the risk that we make at least one type 1 error is 5%. However, postdoc tests can still increase the risk of committing several type 1 errors if we compare many groups. This is why postdoc tests usually involve some sort of correction of the p-values. We'll discuss postdoc tests and p-values corrections in another video. In the next lecture, we'll calculate an ANOVA by hand. Although one usually uses software tools to compute an ANOVA, it is important to understand how ANOVA works, and especially to understand the outputs from those calculations. An example of such an output is shown here. In the next lecture, we'll therefore learn how to calculate the numbers that you see in this table. Thanks for watching.